Department of Psychology. Um, an issue that I've been interested in for a bit now is really the construction of national identity, how we as individuals, based on the social group memberships that we belong to, have implications for the way that, that we think of ourselves as basically US Americans. Um, so in starting this, I'm gonna start it in a different way that I normally wouldn't. Um, one of the books that I came across actually about a year ago uh, is this book by called The Americans uh, by Robert Frank. I should also mention as a quick sort of like parenthetical statement, the uh, uh, sort of formatting is a little off, but the content is there, all right? So uh, think of it as abstract art or something. <laughs> um, the Americans by Robert Frank, it's an interesting book. Um, he basically uh, applied for a Guggenheim Fellowship. Uh, he was a naturalized citizen, uh, and he thought it would be an interesting thing. So he was a photographer, and one of the things that he wanted to do was to actually tour the United States and take photos in terms of what it means to be an American. So he would go through all parts of the United States, southern region, uh, New York City, out to the west coast. Uh, at the end of it, he ended up taking about, what is it, 2,700 photos. And he ended up using about 83 photos. The thing that really in basically sort of interests me about this book, this photographic book, is that for its day, it raised really this interesting set of assumptions or it challenged this idea and presented people who potentially were not kind of living the American dream. He raised issues visually through photography in terms of social class, in terms of racial issues in America. He presented a different set of issues, things were, that were not so glossy and uh, palatable potentially to the American public in terms of a reflection of what America means uh, to its own self. Uh, and you know, he looked at a variety of different things, political life, uh, all the way down to issues of also you know, segregation on the trolley car in New Orleans, all right? Um, what I enjoy about these set of photographs, and I've only shown you a smattering, and I would highly recommend this book. You know, he's not the only one to take issues of social class in America as sort of a starting point. I don't even know necessarily that's what he tried to do. But one of the things that I've always been interested in is really how the kind of uh, psychological or the spaces that we find ourselves in, in terms of racial group memberships, social class group memberships, gender memberships, end up providing very distinct vantage points for understanding, in this case, potentially what it means to be an American citizen. So it's interesting that Robert Frank was this naturalized person, in some sense a person you know, who was uh, not born here, and providing a perspective of the varied experience of what it means to be an American. For me, I guess one of the things that I want to put out there is that it's, for me it feels very sort of liberation psychology heavy in that sense. I'm very much interested not in sort of the dominant perspective of say racial attitudes of that whites racial attitudes towards say African Americans I'm, I'm interested in that issue but I'm interested in how also minority group members racial minority group members make sense of their own life what is it like in some sense to be this one right playing out the role of being an African American or an American what does it mean to be this person playing out the role of being an American given her station in life, and so on. There's something I think that's very kind of powerful in that issue, taking the perspective of the marginalized. So this issue that I've also been interested in, in terms of national identity, e pluribus unum out of many one, is an interesting one for me. I mean, one of the sort of things that I'll bracket off right off the bat and we can talk about later in the questions is whether really we should all feel like one. Should we all feel American? What is there in that? What are the positive implications, but also potentially what are the negative implications of feeling American? Are there certain, for example, racial subgroups that lose something in becoming an American? Um, and there's data out there, and I won't you know, sort of share too much with you, but I'll, I'll present some that you can turn to if you're interested in this issue, and that is 
literally a descriptive snapshot of who feels American, who's patriotic, and in some sense, who's not. Uh, there's data out there in terms of uh, self-report measures that white Americans have higher levels of patriotism than African Americans. Uh, work by Jim Sedanius, uh, who's a social psychologist, political psychologist, has a lot of data to back this up. There's even implicit attitudes work within social psychology that looks at what, that there's conflation. What it means to be American is actually closely aligned with what it means to be white. So one of the things that they do within this paradigm is literally show people very quickly American, U.S. American symbols, White House money, and then they have people actually pair, see how quickly they pair white faces with African American faces to these symbols. And people are more quickly to associate, for example, white faces with sort of these American symbols compared to uh, African American faces. Um, in some sense, well, you know, so, so what? I guess one of the things that sometimes comes out of this sort of set of data where certain groups feel American and other groups don't, and we can talk about what national identity means, and I think we've already started hitting on some of these issues in these presentations, is there is sometimes an argument put out there, well, that ethnic racial group identities obstruct national allegiance, that they actually get in the way, they act as impediments. Interestingly enough, though, I guess one of the things that I would also put out there is at least sort of within contemporary times, that same argument is not necessarily used for um, you know, white Americans. Um, and one of the things that I think is tied to this issue is also this idea that, well, one of the tactics that we can use to sort of manage communities, if that's, you know, if that's one of the themes of this particular panel, is, uh, well, thinking of ourselves as American. And the assimilation perspective is one of the uh, perspectives that is typically thrown out there, that people over the course of time should give up allegiance to ethnocultural identities, and in the process also feel more American, because in some sense that's what happened uh, with uh, sort of old stock European immigration, and that's what should happen in sort of this new wave of immigration. What I want to suggest to you is another way of looking at it, instead of putting the re responsibility solely on the individuals, whether it be racial minorities or uh, immigrant groups that come to, um, in this case, say, the U.S., is that part of the responsibility could also fall, and should fall, on the society itself. Are they creating an atmosphere in which people actually you know, engage, want to become, and feel American? That they don't feel like they necessarily sort of lose something in the process. Uh, is it an atmosphere of recognition and egalitarianism, or sort of at least sort of the ideal of that? Or potentially, is it um, is the American identity in some sense already have built into it sort of this racial hierarchy, and that there might be some reservations to actually identify with that social group identity? And the uh, implicit thing I, here, I think, is that people potentially value their own group identities. People get a sense of, positive sense of self from it, but more than that, I think it, these uh, identities that are from back home, they are rough proxies for the relationships that we have, that we continue to have with other family members. The language that we speak that might not be English might afford us the opportunity to actually connect and have a sense of belonging and place with those people who are very important to us. So what does it mean when there's sort of this principle of assimilation that actually suggests that one of the things you should do is diminish that? Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time here within this idea of the responsibility on the society. And uh, in this interesting book, very brief book uh, that you might want to check out, I think it's a very good book that does a lot of work with regards to issues of globalization, uh, issues of uh, identity and the violence that might actually ensue in terms of threats to valued identities. Amin Malouf suggests the more an immigrant feels that his own culture is respected, the more open they will be to the culture of the host country. Um, and to some extent, this is really actually, I'm giving you what the take home message of this kind of two studies I'm gonna uh, show you are basically all about, that this issue of recognition perceiving that your ethnic, racial, or whatever that subgroup is 
recognized, respected, has positive implications for you actually being open to engaging, identifying with that host nation state or that national identity. One of the issues that I'll bring up right now, but that maybe we can talk about now or a little bit later, is well, what does it mean to perceive that your ethnic racial subgroup is respected? Is it just a matter of not feeling that or perceiving that you're discriminated against as a function of being Latino or African American? Is that enough? Or are we also talking about respect as a form of like socioeconomic, sociopolitical uh, respect? That it's not only sort of that you're not discriminated, but that you're actually, there's economic, socioeconomic integration, sociopolitical integration. Do those things matter and are they reflected of that? So work that I've done with uh, an old colleague of mine has looked at subgroup respect, perceptions of subgroup respect, and the unifying effects. Ethnic racial minorities who perceive more subgroup respect towards their racial subgroup end up having more positive affect towards America, end up having lower in-group favoritism, meaning that they sort of view their group and other groups in sort of positive ways. They don't necessarily favor their own group. They have, it's related to more trust in the justice system of America, okay? So this idea that, oh, don't go, you know, one of the things that we should do is diminish these ethnic racial group identities um, because they get in the way of actually leading to national identity, we've, we have some data that actually sort of at least refutes that or at least challenges it. Because one of the things that people care about, at least in terms of uh, ethnic racial minorities, is that not only is that identity salient, but that it's also a vehicle, and they're sensitive to whether they're, it's recognized and acknowledged in America or not. And if it is recognized, then they end up having more positive affect towards the larger group. And we carried this out also in diverse school settings. So instead of thinking of sort of a subordinate or large group America, it's actually that school setting. And the school setting itself is actually fairly ethnic, ethnic racially diverse. So there's still sort of the subgroup is racial identification. Part of what ends up happening is do the principles, do the other people in the school actually respect my ethnic racial group? And the more they perceive that within that school setting, the more they identify with that school, the less sort of animosity they have towards uh, groups that are outside of their own ethnic racial group. So the kind of flip side here a little bit, and this is sort of a sharp turn, is in some sense what potentially is the opposite or antithesis of subgroup respect. And one of the things that I've become, um, at least in the past year and a half, a bit more interested in is this issue of perceived group discrimination. When your group is not or is the target of discrimination, it is not treated all that well. And there is some work out there within social psychology, as I'm sure other places, but because I'm a social psychologist, that's kind of where I come from, um, or where I start from anyways, is that within this sort of uh, field, there's this rejection identification model. And essentially, basically, racial minorities are sensitive to whether they are, in some sense, targeted uh, in discriminatory fashion by others as a function of their ethnic racial group. And one of the things that actually ends up happening, potentially, is they end up actually identifying a bit more with that ethnic racial group identity. So, to some extent, they're actually excluded from this larger sort of category of America, right? They're discriminated against. And that potentially has sort of negative implications for their mental well-being, at least according to this model. But one of the things that can actually buffer that, if it's sort of a pervasive, ubiquitous form of, or a pervasive discrimination, is that they can identify more with that ethnic racial group. And in identifying more with that ethnic racial group, as a function of being discriminated against, it, that sort of hanging tightly to that ethnic racial group can actually lead to positive uh, mental health uh, sort of implications or well-being, I should say. The other thing that's mentioned within this series is there is also a move away from actually identifying with the larger group itself. Uh, in this case, sort of the uh, American group. 
one of the things that the, in terms of the data that I'll present to you is really kind of testing this rejection identification model, uh, but it also includes data from white majority group members. So I'm looking to see whether perceived group discrimination from racial minorities actually does lead to higher uh, ethnic racial identification, but also is predictive of lower levels of identification with America. And for white majority group members, it's uh, a bit more of an exploratory venture, especially because at the very beginning I showed you the conflation of American identification with racial identification, okay? So in study one, um, we had a fairly big sample of about 800 uh, UCLA students. This was collected in about the mid-90s. Uh, fairly diverse sample. Um, we had, and I should mention, it's sort of this basically questionnaire design. So we had these series of questions which included group discrimination. In America, I experienced discrimination because of my ethnicity. Other members of my ethnic group experienced discrimination. We had national identification, in this case, patriotism or love for one's country, taken from the work by Kosterman and Feshbeck and um, some of their political science work. I have great love for my country. So higher numbers on these items indicated more uh, perceived group discrimination and higher national identification. Uh, I'm sorry that I don't have the racial identification items, but more or less sort of a sense of belonging to the group, okay? that I am a member of this group and it is an important part of sort of being a member of this ethnic racial group. Um, one of the pieces of data that I guess I want to sort of draw your attention to is uh, in terms of group discrimination, so on the x-axis you have things going from low to high levels of group discrimination and on the y-axis you basically have levels of patriotism. The two or three lines that I want to draw your attention to are the orange or yellow line. So as you actually get higher levels of discrimination, there's an uptick in patriotism for white respondents. For racial minorities, higher levels of group discrimination actually lead to sort of this rejection identification model. Uh, what I'm not presenting here, obviously, is the ethnic identification stuff, but basically it falls in line with the rejection identification for minorities, where the more I perceive that I'm discriminated against as a function of my ethnic racial group, the more I actually identify with it. So in some sense, perceived group dis discrimination, they distance, racial minorities distance themselves from patriotism, but identify with their own racial identity. Whites identify with patriotism and there's not much action going on for them for racial identification, okay? So there's, I would argue, potentially a similarity in terms of process, but they're going to different social group identities in terms of what they're identifying with. So this is correlational though. So one of the things that I did uh, several years ago is I took these same items of perceived group discrimination and I did an item order manipulation within the survey. So I literally randomly assigned all participants to receive perceived group discrimination items before the patriotism items and ethnic racial identification items or to get the actual perceived group discrimination items after the um, patriotism racial identification items. All right. So in some sense, priming them to think about whether they're, whether they're discriminated against as a function of their ethnic racial group, and then having them answer how patriotic do you feel after sort of having them think about that, or how patriotic do you feel, and oh, by the way, are you discriminated a lot as a function of your ethnic racial group? All right. Here's a sample, fairly diverse. Um, same items as before. Okay, group discrimina discrimination items just come either before the patriotism and racial identification items, or they come right after. And what I want to draw your attention to is you more or less get the same pattern here. So for example, for white respondents, and here the gray bar is no crime, meaning answer patriotism, racial identification before group discrimination, 
or the black bar prime answer perceived group discrimination, then answer the patriotism and racial identification. And what you get is in the prime condition when they're made to think about whether they're actually discriminated as a function of being white, and we can talk about that too, about the differences there in terms of perceived group discrimination for whites compared to racial minorities, but you get an uptick in their patriotism scores. For Latinos in this case, priming them to think about perceived group discrimination, whether they're discriminated as a function of being Latino in America, leads to a significant downtick in terms of patriotism for, uh, compared to those Latinos who just answered patriotism right away, all right? Um, I guess a couple of things that I, I want to sort of potentially sort of end with. One is this idea you know, that we can talk about in terms of the assumption of national identif identification being a good thing. One of the things I would like you to consider is that if you believe the self-report measures that Jim Sedanius and colleagues have done in terms of who feels most patriotic or the conflation of what it means to be American is more closely aligned with what it means to be white, what are the implications of identifying with America for racial minority group members compared to white majority group members? For white majority group members, it might not be a big deal. Because in some sense, one could, and I'll put this forcefully just to be provocative, is that there's a potentially a sense of ownership of what it means to be an American compared to racial minority group members who uh, it's not the same sort of psychological process. Um, and subgroup identities do not necessarily impede national identity. I presented you some data that perceptions of subgroup respect, as long as those valued identities are recognized, can actually have unifying, what I would call unifying effects. Um, the content of national identity, and this gets to this issue of, I guess, unification, is whether that's even a destination that we want to head to. Um, yes, it's great that we would all, you know, diversity in America is one of our strengths. I guess, you know, I hear that rhetor rhetoric a lot, that we are all sort of a, a nation of immigrants. But what, in some, one of the things to potentially consider is how the social identity of American identity potentially acts as another way of instantiating a racial hierarchy, right? If there's a certain group that feels a sense of ownership over that identity, um, there potentially are positive implications for their sort of psychology, their experience of what it means to be an American compared to other um, groups. And uh, the power status asymmetries across uh, subgroups uh, is something, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that I was very uh, interested in. Uh, and it's really part of what drives the interest in looking at different ethnic racial group experiences of national identity. The last thing I want to leave you with, and it's really sort of an elephant in the room, to be honest with you, is that Rogers Brubaker, I think, kind of captures this issue pointedly. We should not ask what is a nation, but rather how is nationhood as a political and a cultural form institutionalized within and among states. So part of what I have been doing is not really critiquing, problematizing to some extent what national identity is in its varied forms or how it's constructed, but it's sort of how people end up feeling American as a function of whether they're discriminated against. And I think you've seen work so far you know, um, from both of our speakers of how it potentially is a constructed endeavor. And this is where the other part of liberation psychology for me resonates, and that's this issue of really historical collective memory. I've always been interested in issues of identity, and I think memory, in particular, sort of the recreations of memories, the stories we want to tell ourselves, have implications for the way that we view ourselves, our self-conceptions. And I believe that also takes place not only at the personal, but also at the collective level. And one of the things that I think is a strength of this particular perspective is it really takes into uh, immediacy really the impact of how the social representations of past events or even kind of current events and how we decide to keep certain things in and keep certain things out to provide a certain narrative of how we want to create a story about what it feels to be an American. One particular uh, study that I'm doing with regards to this issue 
is examining how different representations of historical collective memory impacts national identity. In particular, one of the things that I'm very much interested in is race relations. And uh, a colleague of mine, Via Salter, and I uh, found a series of photos uh, on the web through a variety of different uh, locations, including such places as Flickr, that actually included sort of Jim Crow era photos. And through the miracle of Photoshop, one of the things that we've done is we, in some sense, have depoliticized these photos, taken away the language of sort of racial oppression. Um, it includes also just, you know, like even Coca-Cola machines that supposedly only whites could use and blacks couldn't use, and we strip the language from those photos. One of the things we're interested in is how creating these, in this case, these two sets of conditions has potentially present-day implications for what we think of ourselves as Americans, how much we identify with what it means to be an American, and what are the different implications for the people who actually go through these photos, whites versus racial minorities. As a very small preview, we have open-ended questions about sort of what the themes are that people think these sort of different conditions are. Not surprisingly, in the original condition, they hit it right on the mark. Jim Crow, racial segregation, discrimination, and they, in most instances, sort of go to also sort of talk about how far we moved from that, and I'm glad that we moved from it. In the edited photo condition, there is literally no language of that that we've run across from a, about 140 people. And typically, what they actually end up mentioning is something closer akin to nostalgia, of how it was, in some sense, actually kind of more simple back in the day. It's about sort of Coca-Cola machines, and there's sort of old cars in some of these photos and how it actually provides a sense of feeling good about what it means to be America. Um, and that's just sort of a, a preview. You know, we don't have any statistics for that. All I can do is sort of just give you a snapshot of some of the narratives that people provide, literally as a simple stripping away of language in some of these photos. Um, I'll leave it at that. Um, and um, yeah.